Good evening, and welcome back to the Masonic Roundtable, a weekly hangout where Masons from around the world get together to talk about Masonic news and opinions in a friendly and social manner. The standard disclaimer applies. The thoughts and opinions expressed here are solely the opinions of the participants and do not represent any Grand Lodge statements or positions. Make sure you keep your conversations open for the public and on the level. Tonight, as usual, we are soliciting questions and comments from you via Twitter at the Twitter name at Mason Roundtable or on the Facebook event page. Let's go around with a quick round of introductions. My name is John Ruark, past master of the Patriot Lodge number 1957. And I'll hand it off to Juan. Good evening, everybody. My name is Juan Sepulveda, and I am a member of Iolo Lodge number 207 in Orlando, Florida. Excellent. And Nick? Hi, I'm Nick Johnson, my past master of Corinthian Lodge number 67 in big time Farmington. And I'm All happy right. to be here. Thank you. Robert? Uh, introducing myself. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Lodge number 78 in Waukegan, Illinois, and the uh, host of Winscape. Excellent. <clears throat> Jason Richards. Thanks, John. My name is Jason Richards, and I am the junior warden of Acacia Lodge number 16 in good old Clifton, Virginia, as well as the presumed Tyler Select of the Patriot Lodge number 1957. I don't know what I did to piss them off. <laughs> Oh, I can think of plenty of things. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> and our special guest tonight, Brother Christian Christensen, would you please introduce yourself and your lodge affiliation? I will be happy to. My name is Christian Christensen. I am the junior deacon of Memorial Lodge number 1298 in Houston, Texas, and I am very happy to be here tonight. Excellent. Thanks. Uh, you will add much to the discussion tonight. We are looking forward to it. Um, <clears throat> But, as usual, let's start with Masonic news. Um, unfortunately, we have some more bad news. Um, I, I called it early. I called it back in, like, March, where we were seeing so many um, examples of arson attempts at Masonic lodges. And yet, news is coming out of Virginia that a new ar Masonic arson attempt was made here in Northern Virginia by um, this guy named... Jason Richards oh, no. almost caught his lodge on fire this week. Um, <laughs> apparently, in uh, a, as uh, part of his punishment, he was actually then elected as uh, and installed as junior warden. So, <laughs> Jason, any more to that story? <laughs> so, yeah, what they did was they, they punished me by, uh, by making sure I could no longer play with fire. So mm -hmm. we had a, a closed installation as... Um, as part of the lodge state of communication, or, or after the state of communication, and it was packed. And Acacia is a very small lodge. Very we probably small. had a, a good 50 people in there at least. And so uh, walking by, um, senior deacon carries the staff, staff hit candle, candle flew across the room, and, uh, and hit the hardwood floors. <laughs> <laughs> and, and an yeah, I had like to ten. <laughs> yes. I just stopped, and people were like, "No, keep going. We got this." <laughs> so I just kept doing my thing while you know there were ten brothers rushing to make sure that the, the candle didn't light the the wooden <laughs> lodge on fire, uh, which would be apropos since you know we just we just had it flood you know ten years ago, and you know, well you know we've destroyed it by by water once you know we might as well destroy it by fire. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so the brethren had good faith in me and said, "You know what? He can no longer play with fire. So let's advance him to uh, to junior warden." So, uh, and in, and in related news, Acacia Lodge has also created a new lodge office, the fireman. The fire, <laughs> armed with the extinguisher of his office. <laughs> Uh, but uh, that brings up another point. Uh, we're seeing a lot on the, the Facebook page here about uh, it is the season for elections and installations. So um, for those who aren't familiar with the Masonic Lodges, most have a one-year term of their officers, and then in the winter, specifically December time frame, there is an election of new officers. And we've talked a little bit about progressive lines before, but... Um, just like as the President of the United States has to be elected and then inaugurated, we also have 
elections, and then installations of officers. So um, many of those things occur before the holidays, so um, just want to congratulate all those listening who have been elected and installed into new positions, and uh, boy, you have your year cut out for you. Yes, good luck. Yes. Just, uh, hey, everybody uh, everybody listening, just make sure you balance your family time with your officer duties. Yes. You're only one person, and, uh, you know, Masonry is a great organization, but it's not worth your family. Just make sure you're taking care of them, too. Well said. Uh, in other news, um, just as a reminder, our Sparklight campaign is drawing to a close uh, next week. A week from tonight, December 16th, we will be randomly drawing a winner to receive a Masonic-related book of our choice and maybe some extra goodies. Uh, you don't have to buy anything from us to participate. Just go on our uh, our Twitter feed or on our Facebook feed. Add a picture of your favorite Masonic book. If you've got a bookmark, stick it in a book and put the hashtag Sparklight on there so that way we can see what you're reading and share some light. So um, we will be picking a winner this time next week, so stay tuned. If you don't have a bookmark, it's okay. Write the Masonic Roundtable, hashtag Sparklight on a post-it or a piece of paper, stick it on the book, it'll be just fine. Remember what I did like three weeks before I got my bookmarks. I took the top half of a cardboard box and made <laughs> a bookmark two and a half feet long. <laughs> you still have it? Classy. Classy. Yeah, I still have it. I keep that nice. forever. It's, it's, it's framed. <laughs> <laughs> in background. Sadly enough, um, hosts of the show are not eligible to receive. Oh, what, dude! Uh, didn't Guest hosts that. are, but yes, uh, yes. but regular hosts are not. <laughs> so, Christian, there's still time for you to do it. I got my bookmark today, so I will be taking pictures. <laughs> nice. nice. Alrighty, <clears throat> now for some other news. Uh, some news from Texas. The Grand Master of Texas, the newly elected and installed Grand Master of Texas, just is issued a proclamation requiring short Masonic educational programs at one of your stated meetings every month. So that's kind of a big deal. Any discussion on, on that? Let me share the a copy of the edict. Yeah. Well, is I think any... this guy is awesome, first off, <laughs> for several reasons. Juan, you can go ahead. I was going to say, if any lodge is super worried of not having uh, someone ready to give a presentation, uh, think of one of these guys there in the in in the little thumbnails in the bottom. They'll be happy to come over and on a monthly basis speak at your lodge. That's a true story. Uh, Grand Lodge will actually also be sharing programs that uh, can just be read for those lodges that don't have it, uh, is what we've been told at least. That's yeah, true. that's actually part of the proclamation. Um, they can they can use a Masonic education program from a multi-part series um, furnished by the Grand Masters Resource Team for 2015. Nice. That's great. You know, it says that a short 10 to 15 minute presentation could be done. You know, it doesn't have to be a paper. I mean, you can read something, you can go off the cuff. Um, you could play a YouTube video. I heard there's a good Masonic educational program <laughs> or podcasts that are out there that could <laughs> help supplement that. Uh, and that's really what we're trying to do. That I'm a big fan of Masonic education. We've talked about that at length. Uh, but I think that's a great idea to require Masonic education. Uh, lately I've seen on Anthony Magelli's uh, Facebook page where he's uh, not calling out certain lodges but basically highlighting the fact that education is often put on the back burner and... Um, I think it is critical to our our growth as Freemasons. Well, well, definitely. In, one pro in, tip. Oh, oh, sorry. Say in in Illinois, when you take an oath of master, and I'm not sure about every jurisdiction. I've not been at every installation in different states, but the master takes upon an oath or obligation to make sure that he will not open or close his lodge without proper instruction. So you actually you take an oath that says you're not really allowed to open or close without having some instruction within the meeting, and that get broke. That 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 law is broken all the time. Uh, we have a way around that in Virginia, but I'll tell you yeah. more about that somewhere else. <laughs> but kudos to this uh, this grand man for putting it out there and making an edict out of it and saying, "Listen, stop, just get it done." 
How, how many of you guys? I know I'm gonna like be interrupting like the flow since it's Swedish, right? But how many of your lodges have what's called a lodge education officer? Because that's what we have here. I, I am the Leo. Yeah. John Ruark might be one. Mm -hmm. For 2014 and 2015, hopefully. I I gave my lodge education up because I am district education. So I get eight or nine lodges, I think. Maybe Sweet. seven. Juan, how about you? Oh, well, I was the lodge education officer one year, but I didn't go to lodge that year. It was a... It was a dark was, year for masonry. It was a dark year for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I felt horrible, but my my family and work didn't permit it, so... It's quite all right. Christian, how yeah. about in Texas? It, it's a concept that's largely unknown, uh, the large education officer down here, so that's probably why this initiative okay. is even more welcomed, I would say. So uh, we're expecting good thing from uh, the Grand Master this year. Excellent. Very interesting. Well, speaking of good things... Speaking of good things out of Texas, but wait, there's more. Um, <laughs> the big news that came out this week also, in Texas, is the conclusion of the story of where there is now mutual intervisitation between the Grand Lodge of Texas and the most worshipful Prince, Prince Hall Grand Lodge of Texas. So what does that mean? It means it's about dang time. <laughs> so why don't uh, let some of the other brothers discuss how big that is and what that really means. It means we can actually, uh, if we have brothers who are Prince Hall, we can talk to them and we can go to their lodges and sit and share brotherhood with them and not have to worry about, you know, being called out about something that some people say is wrong but we know isn't. Or, or even, you know, it, it goes deeper than that. It's, it's, you know, being able to fellowship with someone who's got the same landmarks of masonry uh, without being worried about breaking your obligation. And, I mean, it just it just forms this huge bridge between two of the biggest Masonic bodies um, in the state. And um, it, it's just going to be, you know, it's going to have amazing results, and I can't wait to see what happens. Yes. One, one thing that I think about is, like, I am almost certain that not 100% of the people that watch this show and listen to to us is going to be 100% on board with the decision. However, if that's the case for you and you're listening to us today, remember to continue to behave masonically. You know, one ugly, ugly thing that I've seen on some forums and some different uh, areas is people reducing the uh, unrecognition of these of these different bodies, uh, reducing it to a racial thing. And as Masons, we should rise above that. And, you know, I understand that um, it's a sensitive subject for some people, but it's absolutely wrong. If you're thinking, if you're putting race in between your fellowship and brotherly love, you're doing it wrong. And it's as simple as that. And that happens on both sides, by the way. I'm sure. Yeah. So. Oh, absolutely. Um, and we will be covering that in a future episode, so stay tuned after the new year. We've got that lined up. Um, just another point of clarification. The Grand Lodge of Texas uh, recognized the most worshipful Prince Hall Grand Lodge of Texas back in 2007, but that was basically a recognition of that they're a Masonic body and they're legally chartered to, to work. However, at that time in 2007, there was no intervisitation. A Prince Hall brother could not visit a mainstream brother and vice versa. And so they went for, what, seven years now, um, just with the recognition that they're separate but equal, and now we're actually getting to that, breaking that barrier and you know, visit, visiting across the aisle. So that's fantastic. Mm -hmm. And uh, let's talk to our Texan brother here to figure out what he's heard down at the grassroots level. 
so far, everybody's really, really happy about this. There's been a lot of talk in lodges about this being very overdue, uh, especially in the day and age that we're living in. But uh, as you guys alluded to, there's going to be some opposition both on, on some local lodge levels with maybe some of the elder brethren, but also uh, in certain parts of the state. Um, but there's also going to be a need down here to do some education because there are a number of brethren that do not understand the difference between spurious lodges and Prince Hall. They kind of lumped them all in as clandestine in one big rigmarole. So uh, those of us that are very much in, in favor of this are going to have to do some grassroots work to uh, make sure that it goes well. Um, but we're looking forward to it. I can't wait to come over and see some of the Prince Hall ritual myself. So uh, it was a good Grand Lodge uh, session this year for sure. Excellent. <clears throat> All right. Any other discussion on that major news topic? I mean, we could go on and on, but I think we'll save a lot of the conversations for uh, the Prince Hall episodes and the um, racism ex episodes we have coming up after the new year. Yeah, you won't want to miss those. Those will be fantastic. Mm -hmm. All righty. So moving into tonight's topic, the Swedish Rite. <clears throat> so <clears throat> in Masonry, we have... A Lots of rights. We've talked about the York Rite. We've talked about the Scottish Rite. Uh, these are appendant bodies of masonry. Um, and so a lesser known one here in the States is the Swedish Rite. And I will let Christian kind of give a, a brief overview of what the Swedish Rite is how it, and how it's a little bit different from our traditional American masonry. Okay. I will uh, be happy to. The Swedish Rite is essentially a 10 degree system with then two extra honorary degrees, the 11th and the 12th. It's worked um, presently in uh, most of the Nordic countries, that being Norway, Iceland, Finland, Sweden of course, and then Denmark, which is the Grand Lodge that I visit on a regular basis because I'm Danish, I grew up. Uh, and, and was raised over there, even though I took my Masonic degrees over here. Um, there's intervisitation between, you know, York Rite and, and Scottish Rite, so if you reach certain degrees there, you can come over and visit the, uh, the Swedish Rite. If, for instance, you're a 32nd degree um, Scottish Rite Mason, you will be able to visit the 8th degree and below in the, uh, the Swedish Rite. Um, not talking too much history, but Basically, the right came about in uh, around 1780 or somewhere around there. Most of those countries at that point in time was using the, uh, the right of strict observance, which has came, come up from Germany. But uh, one of the, uh, the Swedish kings actually started reworking this with, uh, with some of his guys and actually um, came up with was. Uh, with the Swedish Rite and that then spread from there. Uh, Denmark for instance introduced it in 1852 uh, by royal decree where it was also the uh, the king that was the Grand Master at that point in time and it has been worked there ever since. Uh, so it's it's got uh, what a couple of hundred years uh, you know behind it more or less. <clears throat> Very cool. Now um, <clears throat> so the first three degrees are they uh equivalent to the first three degrees that we have in the United States? More or less, the, the degree structure is actually a little bit different than what we have. What they do is they take the ten degrees and then they, they group them into what they call lodges. So the first three degrees will be in the Lodge of St. John's. Then the fourth and fifth, which is actually a degree given at the same night, and the sixth is then in your Lodge of St. Andrews. And then the 7th through the 10th degree is in what can directly be translated as the chapter. So the first three degrees are very similar to what we see. Uh, first and third especially. The second degree does not have the same feel of the fellow craft that we know uh, with all the seven liberal arts and sciences. It's a degree that up to I think it's six people can take at the same point in time. And it's very much a, a happy degree that's about you know getting more light, fraternalism, brotherhood and everything like that that then sets you up to what we all know that happens in the third degree. Um, I think esoterically it probably reminds me most of what I've seen in the York Rite especially in some of the higher degrees as well uh, but there are stark differences. So that's a good point. Um, 
I wanted you to confirm one thing that I read that said that in my preparation for the show <clears throat> that really the Swedish Rite takes a little bit out of the York Rite and takes a little bit out of um, some of the Rosicrucian philosophical concepts and puts that in that 10 degree system. Is that is that a fair assessment? Yeah, I, I think you could definitely say that. What you see with the 10 degree system is that the degrees are more interlinked than I sometimes think that you see uh, in, for instance, Scottish right, where there are so many, and, and maybe even to a certain extent in York right. They're very much made to be a journey that you progress through where where one ends, the next one almost begins. Um, but but it definitely has some of those things. If if you look at the historical research, I think a lot of these degrees and rights came up more or less the same point in time, and they've definitely borrowed from from some of the same sources. Well, and what, and, oh, oh, sorry. Uh, go ahead, Nick. Well, thinking about the structure, now from what I understand, th this is what I was told anyway, is that once you're once you're done with your third and you're moving on to the fourth and the fifth, you you actually leave. St. John's Lodge, and you move to St. Andrew's Lodge, and it, do you renounce your membership in the earlier body, or are you kind of moving on a continuum of some kind, and you're maintaining these memberships in the past bodies, or are you... You're, you're continuing it on. The the best way to compare the structure to easily understand it is the same kind of setup as you have in the York Rite. You know, so you will take the first three degrees in what you call your St. John's Lodge. You know, which, for instance, in Copenhagen, you know, the capital of Denmark, there might be 20 St. John's Lodges. You know, so you'll take your first three degrees there. Then afterwards, you either petition one of the St. Andrew's Lodges, or you talk to somebody, or maybe they invite you. And then you continue your journey there. And then again, depending on how active a mason you are, you can still go back and visit your St. John's Lodge whenever they're meeting, and then also be active in your St. Andrew's Lodge. And then again, when you've gone past that, then you move up to the chapter, of which there's only one. Um, and then you can take your, your further degrees there. So it, it's a lot similar to what we have in, in you know, kind of Blue Lodge in York, right, in, in that aspect. So super important question here. Do you have to pay dues to each separate lodge? Yes, you do. And uh, the, the, the first, the St. John's dues are very high. And then the further ones going on are considerably lower. But for instance, comparing to what, uh, what we're paying over here, you'd find it much more expensive. I think they're often paying up to, you know, five, six, seven hundred dollars a year for membership and then in addition to that you know they have a dress code which is you know black tie that's also something you have to pay for after each large night there's usually an agape that's another expense that's out there so it's it's a little more expensive than uh, than we're used to here in the US I love it how, how often do they meet that's actually one of the interesting things that, that I want to touch some of the things on uh, tonight and that is the fact that um, Large operations are very differently from what we see over here in the U.S. And again, if you want to be really pedantic, you can say that's not really the Swedish right that's mandating that. That's Grand Lodges, but you know they're almost identical. What they normally do is they only have a Masonic year through from September through March, so it's not year-round as we necessarily know. And then the first thing they start doing that year is that a lodge will always meet in a given degree on a given night. So, for instance, and they will always meet in that degree room. So, for instance, if we take the Grand Lodge of Denmark in the center of Copenhagen, they have a very big temple there. But there is only one first degree room, one second degree room, and one third degree room. So, they might have ten St. John's Lodges as all need to use those ones. So, they'll simply split them up. So, they'll say the first week you're meeting in your third degree, next week you're meeting in the second degree, then you're meeting in the third degree again, then you're meeting in the first degree. So they do that for all the St. John's Lodges. Then they do that for the St. Andrews, and then they do it for the chapter. So if you're a really active Mason, you're going to end up going to Lodge three nights a week, oh. but only, you know, from September through March. Hmm. Okay. Um, and one thing that might be worth mentioning here is that what all of us would say is, well, what's the wife going to say? What's the family going to say? They have a rule over there, and that is that the wife has the same degree as you do. You can really? And share anything with her. You can talk to her. She can't be in the lodge. She can't go into the degrees. She can't see them or anything like that. But you can go home and tell about what happened. Wow. Wow. 
<laughs> For the record, my wife would want no part of that. <laughs> no, no. But I mean, there isn't any appendant bodies over there, so there isn't an eastern star or anything like that. They'll have some balls for the ladies, but you know that's kind of the only interaction. I don't think a lot of guys talk a lot, but the guys that I've talked to, they say, well, it's nice that I can come home and at least share it with somebody that's this close to my life. I don't have to keep secrets for her. Yeah, that's that's interesting. I I I, I don't want to hear any hate mail, but I kind of like that idea. Sorry. <laughs> well, I think it's really cool that that in the absence of appendant bodies, they still have that avenue for family involvement, and you that frees you up to devote time to, um, you know, your various lodges. So so the the lodge structure almost takes the place of those appendant bodies. Yeah, to a certain extent, and that's that might be one of the controversial things. I know if if we want to get the the controversy about the right out at the same point in time, what you often hear uh, that the right gets bashed for is that it is a Christian right and that you have to be a Christian in order to join it, and that that's that's true and it's not true. So yeah, let's talk about that. What's how hard is that rule? Well, what happens is that during the degrees you're going to take some obligations. And it, it's very clear that in, in the language of the ritual, it is definitely based on a Christian foundation. But I would venture to say that so is our Blue Lodge and York Rite Masonry to a certain extent. What the rule is in some of the Grand Lodges is that you don't necessarily have to be a Christian, but you have to be baptized. Hmm. Now, those things are almost synonymous. And for instance, if we take Denmark, that, that wasn't really an issue because me growing up, I think 95% of the people I grew up with, they were baptized. So, you know, it's just kind of the thing that you do. Grand Lodge of Denmark still has that as a rule. Grand Lodge of Sweden, for instance, have completely abolished that one. So you do not have to be baptized, you can just join. But I, I don't think that you would ever see the situation where they would, pill, uh, where they would pull up a, um, you know, the Torah or where they would pull up a Quran and let anybody take an obligation on that, I, I don't think the right would go that far. So it would still be on the Bible that you would swear, and, and just as you know from the commandery, the, uh, the ritual text is very Christian-centric. But if you really want to look at it, you don't have to be a Christian, but you kind of do. Well, isn't it like, I mean, in Nordic countries, right? I mean, it's kind of just a thing where you just get baptized. I mean, I, I know some some uh, people up there that are atheists that would just get their kids baptized because, eh, whatever, it's just the thing to do. So exactly, I think within the last ten years you've seen a a change in that. But before that, everybody got baptized. It was just what you did. You got baptized, you got confirmed, you got married in the church. You know, so you can say if you see the right in the light of that, that that was the norm. I think it takes some of the the, the sting out of it. All right. Now you were talking about some of the differences. Can you kind of go into a little more detail about? the organization, the structure of the lodges and how they're different than what we do here in American masonry? I mean the structure in, in how it all works is is vastly different and there's going to be some shocks coming up here about whether, whether that's good or bad. As we talked about, September to March is when they actually work. But if we look at, for instance, um, line officers, worshipful masters and everything like that, there's no progressive lines, first of all. That, that doesn't exist. Uh, when you're an elected as a worshipful master, you're elected for a four-year period. Hmm. You know, wow. and everybody's like, four years, that's got to be terrible. But what the worship <laughs> master also has is he has a first deputy, and in many lodges he also has a second deputy. So he basically only presides a third of the time, you know, and again, from September through March. But in those four years, he, is, he rules supreme, just as you will, uh, will see over here, and he can actually get elected for another four-year period if, uh, if he wants to. So there are some of them that will end up sitting there for eight years. There's no progressive line, but you will have elections once a year where any brother can then say, this year I want to run for you know, second deputy worshipful master, or I want to run for senior warden. And then they simply take a vote and people get, uh, get elected to that. And then there's also some appointed positions. Um, so you know, there's sort of some different uh, differences there. Well, it's kind of like, you, know, you could almost say it's not, like in American masonry at least, it's like the lodge office is the thing, right? But it seems like in the Swedish rite, the degree is the thing. It's, it's kind of the way that it is structured that way. Very much so, very much so. One of the things that's interesting also is that all of their ritual text is written down. So the worshipful master has a 
binder in front of him for every degree that he follows, you know, as he's going through it. Naturally, there are some walking parts that you have to remember, and I think most Worshipful Masters have also tried to commit most of the things to memory, because, you know, if you're reading, it just doesn't sound as good. But you don't get the situation, as we sometimes see in, in U.S. lodges, where there's the psst, psst on the sideline, or the guy <laughs> that, that completely forgets the ritual. So in that sense, I like it, but on the other hand, I do think that there's something good about learning from, you know, mouth to ear and, and the fellowship and bond that that creates. Hey, Christian, can you uh, touch a little bit on uh, on why exactly the Masonic year only runs from uh, September to March? Because I think it's interesting that, that they're dark during the, the times where it's light pretty much 24-7. I mean, you know, there, there. there might be some historical reasons that would have to do with harvest and everything like that, but any brother that I've asked over there usually looks at me dumbfounded and says, well, we've got to have time for something else besides masonry. <laughs> <laughs> have you seen our district calendar? District 4 <laughs> calendar is jam-packed. <laughs> Eight days a week there's something to do. <laughs> so. Yeah, and, and to a certain extent, I, I mean... I maybe like that a little bit because you can get a little burned out and a little busy, as all of us know. But on the other hand, I don't know if I'd like to run to lodge three nights a week, which even some of us are doing anyway. I think what you often see is that most Masons fall in love with one of the lodges. You're either very active in your St. John's, in your St. Andrews, or in your chapter. Then you might get the degrees in the other lodges. You usually get one a year. You know, there's kind of system of advancement there. Um, you don't have to learn any ritual uh, catechism that you turn in. Uh, they say there's some education and some studies that you have to do on the side, but most of the guys that I've talked to is like, ah, you know, you get scheduled a year ahead, uh, and then uh, then you'll get your next degree at that point. In time. You know, another thing related to the differences: if an American Freemason just went and sat in one of the lodges over there, what would be the first like big indicator that this is, this was operating very differently? Um, the lodge is set up a little bit differently. As I mentioned, each degree has its own room. So, for instance, the first degree has one, you know, second, third, and they're all very different. They're all very much set in the, the tone of the degree. Um, for instance, the Grand Lodge of Denmark, because it's such an old building, you know, 100 years at least, and because they've had money, all the rooms are very, very beautiful. So that's interesting to see. Um, but I think the first thing that they would really notice is that the aprons are different. Do you um, want to show and, some pictures of yeah, that? And I can actually try and see if I can do a little smart screen share because each degree has an apron associated with it. Let me see if I can get the technology to work here. I think I can. So, for instance, right now we are looking at what? 7th, 8th, 9th, 10th, and 11th degree. Um, you know, dresses. As you guys will notice, uh, you're always meeting in black tie, basically. That is from first degree and onwards, no exception whatsoever. You wouldn't be let in. And then each degree will have a different apron, and some of them will also have ribbons and various, you know, medals and everything like that. And each degree and each, you know, paraphernalia that you wear or, or your dress code it alludes to something that you've been taught in that degree. Um, I can try and see if I can. Christian, yeah, I have a quick question. In in all of the symbolism of things that I've looked at, uh, nowhere in the Swedish system do I see uh, a square and compass. Oh, do you guys dun, dun, dun. use that? Wait a minute. What is that? that? It is used. Um, it is the the symbol of Freemasonry over there. You will you will see that it's actually. Um, it doesn't have the G in the center. That's the, the big difference in it. But you still use the square and compass. It'll be outside every building that you do. The master has the square. They basically use the same um, symbols for the Grand Lodge officers as uh, as we do. Sure, sure. I mean, well, this, the, the G was added, what, turn of the century here in the United States. Is kind yeah, of it's a U.S. thing. Yeah. yeah. The uh, other big difference that you will notice when you're in there is that uh, all the Masons carry swords, basically. They will all have a, a, a row of swords outside the uh, the lodge room, 
Um, and they are carried in each degree because you are a defender of the faith and a defender of masonry. So where we in America are very much, you know, cannot taking anything offensive or defensive into it, there it's very essential. And the swords are actually used throughout the degrees in uh, in various uh, different times and uh, and at various points. So um, man, it's just like commandery. I uh, know. Oh my god. <laughs> Except this without like the poodle the hats. Movie. Nick, yeah. Nick is on cloud nine. <laughs> I know. I'm sitting here going, wait, you guys get swords? And you guys have all kinds of degrees? We're moving. And I, I, only have to write one check, or I only have to write checks to one bodies. I don't have like a thousand bodies I can do. Oh, it's so oh. awesome. <laughs> Sounds like a Masonic Exodus. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm on Hipmunk right now looking for my plane ticket. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I almost want to go and say, but wait, there's more. If you guys think oh. that is the, the crazy oh stuff, then I'm really about to blow you guys out. Um, a general lodge night will always start up that you meet outside the lodge room, and then you process into the room. So first, uh, you know, the Grand Lodge officers, if any are there, will press in, then uh, process in, then it will be the, uh, um, the line, and then you will process from your degree and downwards, so starting with 10th, 9th, 8th, and so forth, and then you sit various places in the room. Then you open the lodge, then you have you do a degree for that night. So again, if it's the third degree you're meeting in, then you've got your candidate for the third degree, you run through that. And then afterwards there will always be an educational portion where one of the brethren will give the speech of tonight. And it's usually something that's related to that degree. Nice. But then what doesn't happen is that there are no minutes, there are no oh. motions, there are no claims, there are no accounts, there's no talking about all those kind of things that we see over there, they have elected a group of officers, and those officers, they run the business. Because why would you waste your time in that in large? I know! <laughs> <laughs> it's all the best parts of masonry without all of the worst. <laughs> oh, <my God. laughs> Early in the year, one of the first lodges you will have is your, your finance lodge, where the treasurer will, will give the budget for the year. And, and how it's going from last year, then you don't talk about it again. You never hear about it. That's fantastic. Oh. Amazing. You know, next year, I've, I've already been told, so, so after my year as master, I'll be going into secretary. And I want to make sure that everybody in my lodge knows that they can make a motion to skip the minutes. This is We're great. not allowed to do that in Virginia. Yep. You have to read the minutes in Virginia. Yep. That's horrible. Now they do have <laughs> a treasurer. They do have a secretary. They do take minutes, you know, for uh, to be saved for posterity and everything like that. But nothing like that. And once the you know the education is uh, is finished, they close the lodge. You process out, and then you go downstairs, and then you have an agape, where you know you usually have a meal that costs a little bit of money as well. And then you go to the other room and have coffee. Uh, they do serve alcohol in the Grand Lodge of Denmark, so you can usually have uh, a beer or two there if you want, and then uh, maybe a little shot if uh, if that's what you want with your coffee. But then they've instituted Ooh, a rule that you have to close lodge by 11 because I think they had some tendencies for lodge nights to go very, very late. So 11 o'clock, the worship master usually kicks you out. You guys actually get to go on break, go have a libation, and come back and lodge is still open you have to close it? No, they, they, they close lodge before and then you go oh. to the agape. Oh, I had a little bit of, I was, I was kind of, Kind of hoping it wasn't, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, I know what you're getting at there. It, I've never seen the lodge called from uh, from labor to refreshment or or uh, otherwise over there, unfortunately. But maybe it's something to suggest. Well, so the other thing too, just to go back, I mean, it's, this is all fascinating. I think you can see how giddy the rest of us are about. It, it really is the the best part of masonry. Um, I think just one thing to reemphasize what I think Robert was alluding to was primarily in the regalia even, what we're seeing is that it's less of the square and compass and more of St. George's Cross. Yeah. Right? And so that's re-emphasizing the Christian nature. Do you, can you elaborate any more on that? I, I think that's definitely true. As I said, you'll definitely see the, uh, the square and compasses, but the, the St. George Cross is definitely what you know as the Masonic symbol over there. Uh, most lodges will have a flag outside it, and that will be the St. George Cross, you know, a red one on a white background. Uh, you know, it, 
exactly as uh, somebody's pulling up there. What a like okay, so if you you're Mason in Denmark, you were okay, so we're talking about regalia and whatnot. Would you wear a Masonic ring or you know, like over here, I mean, literally today I went out of my house and I realized I had this epiphany. I was wearing a shirt John Paul Gomez made from Fraternal Ties. It was a really nice Masonic shirt. I had a watch on that was Masonic. I had my ring on, and I was like, oh, my God, the only thing I'm missing is my belt buckle. <laughs> it was a little bit ridiculous. I was like, I have to go back home and change. <laughs> but okay, So over in Denmark or whatever, you know, uh, anywhere that practices the Swedish Rite, are we talking about, like, I mean, if you guys have a Masonic ring, do you guys wear rings? Do they wear this kind of stuff? And if they do, is it the St. George's Cross, or are they more primarily wearing you know, a square and compass? I actually have a picture of it right here that I can try and share. That is the official uh, Masonic ring that you will uh, wear over there. It's usually made of gold, so it's a little bit expensive. But you're only allowed to wear that once you receive your eighth degree. You're wow. not allowed to wear it before then. Generally, you do not see Masons wearing Masonic regalia. Um, I wouldn't say that it's it's underground or that people don't know about it or anything like that but it's it's definitely not as open as you see over here large mm. buildings will have square and compasses on them uh, and i mean and it's something that you talk about but but it, not in the same extent that you see over here at all mm-hmm. hey christian great. that brings me to uh, to another question for you now, you've talked a lot about the the grand lodge of denmark um how widespread is is masonry in areas that uh, that aren't very highly populated, like rural areas, as opposed to the urban centers? If, if to put Denmark a little bit in context to you guys, uh, it's a small country. You can probably drive from one end of the uh, of the country to the other in about six to seven hours. You know, so it's not the largest one. Five and a half million uh, people live there, and there's about ten thousand masons. So. I don't know what the quick math on that says, but there is a Masonic Lodge in almost every major city. But one of the things that's also interesting there is that you have these small Masonic Lodges, and then you have kind of your Grand Lodge in Copenhagen, which is the capital, and then three or four provincial lodges. The small Masonic Lodges are only allowed to bestow the St. John's degrees, i.e. the first three, upon their candidates. Then they can open the St. Andrew Lodges as a lodge of instruction, basically, but because they do not have the correct room, they cannot confer those degrees. Okay. So you, you have a lot of St. John's Lodges that's feeding into fewer St. Andrew's Lodges that's then feeding up to only, basically, I think there will be three chapters in the, in, in the so three main provincial ones. Theory very similar to the way it is here in the States with us having multiple Blue Lodges. Um, I mean, in, in the past, you know, early 1900s, you would see, I mean, here in the northern Masonic jurisdiction of the ancient Scottish Rite, it's a little different. You know, our, our uh, appended bodies are different. We've got um, the princes of Jerusalem and all these other things. And so each one is very, uh, they're more sparse. That's really interesting that it's this almost. It really is almost the same way, just, but it's all under one governing body. Exactly, exactly. And I, I, I don't know if it sometimes makes it easier, but, um, you know, without putting anybody down, I think that sometimes there's a tendency to see people getting positions because the, because they like the titles and and with no appended oh. bodies. Being yeah, that there. happens here all the time. Don't worry about <laughs> it. Listen. You know, there's there, there's none of that because you know that you're gonna advance one degree a year, basically. Right. Um, you know, so I don't know if it takes the fun out of it, but it's it, it's just not there. I think it creates a very nice defined expectation of what you're going to be getting out of masonry. And yeah. I, I kind of like that because here it's like, you know, oh, you you you're friends with this dude. Hey, you want to be an AMD? Come on in, you know. And right. I like that where it's just this defined expectation so, of you're going to get a degree every year. So with what John was asked, who he was talking about earlier. Um, having to do with, you know what? I don't want to. I don't want to go back too far. So just keep going. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, actually, I, let me let me interject and say, in the interest of time, you had some pictures you wanted to share too. I know you hit a few. Why don't you yeah. hit a few more, and then we'll switch to social media. How's that sound? We'll we'll do that. The one thing I do want to mention though is now that we're talking about the progressive line, the grandmaster is elected until he's 75. So holy instance, smokes! When, you, when oh. you get a guy in at uh, at 60. He's going to sit there for a while, so you better hope that you like him. 
But, uh, <laughs> but here's a but question. Let me try. Oh, sure. Uh, could I ask one crazy question? Yeah, but, okay. This is the greatest right I've ever heard of in my entire life. It's <laughs> <laughs> not a question, that's a statement. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, you're right. I'm, I'm leading it. That is an so assertion. Is... Yeah, exactly. And, and it's a correct assertion, so let's just go with it from there. <laughs> Your logical <laughs> fallacy is. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, this. it seems like this is like the greatest Masonic right I've ever heard of. Why hasn't it traveled outside of the Nordic countries? I mean, there was one time on St. Bart's, and then there was, like, a Chinese lodge of, of travelers. Is there a reason why it's never even traveled to, like, England, where it's just kind of... I, I almost want to say translation and language barriers, because it's never been translated across, and I don't know if the Grand Lodge of Denmark would be open for us doing it. There's actually a couple of us that's talked about that it could be cool to do over here, but I think considerable legwork will have to be done. It, it actually is also... A Existing in, in Spain, uh, Spain is a, a popular place for Danish people to go down and retire. Um, so there is actually a couple of lodges down there that operate almost under the Grand Lodge of Denmark, and they do the uh, the Swedish right down there. But I think language, that's what I would say. So uh, It's also practiced a little bit in Germany too, isn't it, Christian? I think there might be a couple of them down there. I know there's more some, some lodges that do those, still do the right of strict observance, uh, but okay. I think that close to the border there's probably a couple. All right, okay. so what, let's see some pictures, and while you're bringing those up, you know, I think it would be kind of kind of awesome to have that thing translated and have the the Murica right. <laughs> that would uh, that would be an interesting one. Let me let me Is just. Is that called the shrine? <laughs> All right, so here we got some regalia. Here we got some regalia, first, second, third degree. You guys can notice that the first degree is very similar to what we also know. And then I think second and third degree looks much more like we know from English emulation, right? So, so not too much interesting there. They start getting a key in at the third degree. Um, this is actually the Grand Lodge of Denmark's second degree room. Ooh. You guys will notice that the wardens are all in the, uh, the west. There's nobody sitting in the south. And up here, you actually have the various constellations painted. Um, this is kind of a classic one. You'll have the Worshipful Master in the east, as usual. And then you'll generally have brethren sitting on both sides. Uh, the closer to the Worshipful Master, the more prestigious in, uh, in general, of course. I'm just going to keep going, but stop me at any time. Um, fourth and fifth, and then sixth. You guys will notice that at, at fourth and fifth degree, you get a uh, a dark apron with a skull on it, uh, alluding to uh, to some of the earlier degrees as well um, that you guys will probably know. And then we have the ones that we're looking at here. Uh, tenth, that is, uh, at eleventh, that's when you become Knight Commander of the Red Cross. Yeah, so I, I was reading it. that that actually is usually pretty much conferred only on Grand Line officers, is that correct? Yeah, more or less, basically. So, or if you have a brethren that's, you know, done something outstanding, but, but Grand Lodge officers mainly, yes. So you just guys, you don't stop at 10, you crank it all the way up to 11. Yeah, <laughs> and then actually the uh, Grand Master is 12th degree, to, uh, to be honest. Uh, but, you know, 11th and 12th are only honorary degrees, so we usually call it a 10 degree system. And, and how do you figure out what, what you you know, quote-unquote, qualify for as, you know, somebody who's a member of, say, Commandery or Royal Arch or whatever when you're moving. You know, I know they've got these, like, tables of translation or tables of, uh, you know, whatever they would say, similar similar degree. Yeah. Um, the Scottish Rite Ritual and Monitor, in one of the pages in there, there is a conversion chart between the Scottish Rite and the um, the Swedish Rite, uh, the Southern Jurisdiction Ritual and Monitor. To be honest, I don't know about the uh, York Rite, but I think it would be the same. But I'm fairly certain that 14th degree would give you into at least 8th, probably 9th. Uh, and after that, you need to start getting some of your, your you know, honorary KYCH or whatever it'll be. Okay. Uh, what else have you got? Moving on, this is actually interesting. At the eighth degree, you get your 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 coat of arms. I think it's called that. You get to design with the Grand Lodge heraldic guy, uh, with your motto and everything like that on it. And then is that uh, you know put up somewhere in the Can Grand Lodge building? Doing this? Nick's face, like, <laughs> his jaw dropped. 
if you guys have to watch the YouTube video. If you're just... <laughs> I can find if I can zoom in a little bit more. So basically, every all these ones here are are various things. Then the outer border will be. I think it starts out as black, and then if you become a Grand Lodge officer, it gets painted red, and if when you're deceased, then it goes white or something like that. But these ones are scattered all over the uh, the Grand Lodge of Denmark, basically. Um, moving on, this is this is the Grand Lodge of Denmark, a, a building in in downtown Copenhagen. It is three um, floors above ground, two floors below ground. Um, the Grand Lodge of Denmark actually has a lot of affinity with the, the U.S. in the sense that when it was occupied during the Second World War, uh, it was trashed to a certain extent, and uh, a lot of U.S. masonry donated money to it afterwards. So in the Grand Hall downstairs, there's a big plaque uh, commemorating that. Um, what they did when they were uh, occupied was they actually took all the Masonic regalia, put it down in one of the rooms downstairs, and basically, you know, bricked up the whole wall, you know, and, and put wallpaper on it, whatever it is, so the Germans and the Nazis never found it, even though uh, they were looking for it. Holy cow. Wow. Um, first, second, third, was that the last okay. one I had? I think we yeah. got all of them. Awesome. Yeah, well, nope, sorry, that's the sword that uh, is usually used. Also with the cross of St. George's on there. Yeah, with, with the cross of St. George on there and everything mm -hmm. like that. Let's see if I can get out of this screen share. All right. Well, let's, uh, let's switch to Jason and cover some of the... Oh, wow. Not only did he get out of screen share, he left all together. So <laughs> hopefully he'll get, come back <laughs> Let's, yeah, uh, send him another invite. Hey, there oh, here he comes. Okay. So, yeah, we've had a, a lot of great interaction on, on social media tonight. Um, our, uh, our friend Donnie Dillon um, has had an interesting... Uh, he's been commenting a, a good bit about the, the overt um, Christian nature of, of the Swedish Rite, and he was just curious as to whether or not there, there are any other flavors in masonry operation, operating in Sweden, or if the Swedish Rite really is the, the only one, just because, um, you know, there, he's gotten some survey data that says, you know, only 18% of Swedish citizens actually, you know, responded that they believe there's a god. Um, so it, it seems interesting having a, an overt Christian requirement when the majority of the population may or may not be truly Christian. That's a good question. Hmm. You back with us, Christian? We can't hear you, buddy. So we can table that one for for now. But uh, there's also been a little bit of confusion. I think Nick can answer this one between the Swedish right and the Swedenborgian right. I think Robert can can deal with that one a little bit. <laughs> oh gee. Uh, all right. So uh, the Swedish right is just what we've been hearing about tonight. The Swedenborgian right um, is a uh, a right of Freemasonry that has a few more degrees in some places and a few less degrees in some places. The problem with it currently is that it is uh, unrecognized in some places, and in fact in the past was recognized for the ancient accepted Scottish Rite uh, southern jurisdiction. Uh, I can't tell you when it was when it stopped being recognized. Uh, the Swedenborgian Rite, there are some great books upon it. Uh, you can find at your local valleys usually. Um, essentially the degree system, some places it, it goes as high as six degrees um, and it ensures uh, much in common with uh, your uh, Golden Dawn, your Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn your degree systems in some places. And in other places I've seen it have as many as 99 degrees, like your Memphis Miserum Rites, which again is an unrecognized mistake. Okay. <clears throat> Robert, we lost you. Wow. <clears throat> okay. Jason, you're still muted. Let's try to get some of these technical difficulties uh, worked out here. <clears throat> Sorry, they're dropping like flies. <laughs> and I was micing my mute, or I was my, I was muting my mic. Wow, it's late. Um, <laughs> so that I could try to to uh, get Christian's um, stuff working. But let's see. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes, yes, we can hear you now. Uh, sorry about that. I think the hang-up has a 
stop sharing but you're too close to each other. Uh, I, I heard the question though, which was whether or not there was any other rights working in these countries. Denmark at least, and I think Sweden as well, actually has the normal English emulation like the first three ones working. So there are there are other associated lodges that still work on the Grand Lodge of Denmark that work the first three degrees as we know. And then I think normally once you've taken those, you can actually almost move over and take the Swedish right as an appendant body at that point in time, uh, if, uh, if that's the case. Okay. Anything else, Jason? <clears throat> nope, that just about covers it. Um, yeah. No, I mean, most of the comments were, were geared toward the, the overt Christian affiliation. But, uh, you know, it's, go ahead, Christian. Esoteric things I can, uh, I can say. Uh, I'm just trying to put my mic back in. Can you hear me now? Yes, much loud and clear. Yeah, much better. That was just a little thing. Um, the esoterics we can't talk that much about, but they're very similar, at least the first three degrees. But the third degree, uh, as we all know, in the second section of it, uh, you have a person walking around and he meets three different people, and a certain thing happens to him when he meets the third guy. That actually happens to the candidate there by the Worshipful Master. But the play as we know it is not acted out at all. Uh, once that event has happened, um, a story is basically told, which is the story of what we normally, you know, act out ourselves. Uh, so there are some some distinct differences in the third degree there. <laughs> Interesting. All right. Well, let's start wrapping it up. We've been going for quite a while, and geez, we could go on for much much longer because I think, uh, as you can tell by the response of the panelists, there are is much to this the system that we really like, and so. Um, with that, let's start wrapping up and giving some final thoughts and uh, closing statements. So, Mr. Quiet tonight, let's switch to Juan here. I am exercising the listening uh, virtue today. I'm in, uh, in Zen. But I think it's fascinating. I absolutely love <clears throat> everything I'm hearing about it. Uh, <clears throat> the main thing that I that I enjoyed was the fact that so little of the business is happening on the actual meeting and that that opens up room for actual ritual and education <clears throat> one thing i've been talking about lately with some with some brothers was that if we could only increase efficiency in the business that we do in lodge especially the fact that we have committees that are entrusted with some research and decision making, that should be enough for when those decisions are brought into the lodge to be respected and you know acted upon. But instead, usually what I've seen is that it get everything gets rehashed again. It's like, well, you, why have a committee? You know, why <laughs> why give these people this task if we're gonna then scrutinize it to to death within the meeting? Uh, anyway, uh, but Brother Christian, I greatly appreciate that you joined us. I honestly had no knowledge of the Swedish right, and you know this is—it's very fulfilling to hear uh, what you share with us today. Are we wrapping up? Yeah, Juan, what do you have behind you? Behind me, I'm glad you pointed this out. Uh, you've probably seen that I've been posting about my. Pin collection display apron, and without tearing my ears apart, <laughs> I want to I want to show you this, brothers. I'm really excited about it. This one's mine. I'm keeping forever. I absolutely love it. Thank you. Uh, Where can I buy there, one? You can go to FreemasonryArt.com, and these are the two sizes. You can see this is the regular size, and that's the larger size. For brothers like uh, Robert, who have hundreds and hundreds of pins. <laughs> this is a false statement. I don't have hundreds. Maybe. Yeah, yeah they're actually. Uh, you've got an introductory price going on on those too. So uh, if you get them now, um, you'll, you'll pay a good bet less than after the holidays. It, exactly. Uh, every week, the price will continue to go up to its regular price. So uh, jump in early, and. I got one. Uh, 
I have a, an episode of The Winding Stairs coming up, and I am doing putting everything in order so that I can have The Winding Stairs on the year 2015 be a weekly program. Uh, but Ooh. You know, yeah, so you'll hear more about that. Make sure you go to thewindingstairs.com and sign up for the email so you'll be the first one to hear about what's going on. More one all the time. All right, Robert. Uh, you know, I don't have uh, a whole lot, I guess, to, to, to wrap up with. I did want to revisit two quick questions uh, for Christian. And the first is being uh, visitation. So you said if I was a 32nd degree Scottish Rite Mason, I could go to the lodge in the 8th degree? Yes, 8th degree and below. But and you can below. visit already from 3rd degree. Okay, so the only way to visit to the uh, tenth degree, which does not include like your honoraries, is to actually join the Swedish uh, right, correct? Yes, it probably would be, and that's not as easy as it sounds because over there they only allow you to be a member of one lodge, so you almost have to move to the country. Whoa! Uh, okay. I know. And uh, so we were talking earlier, really quickly, about uh, the uh, integration of the Scottish Rite and the York Rite, um, and all of this kind of blends into this really neat amalgamation of the Swedish Rite. Um, does the Swedish Rite have a submarine degree? <laughs> not, that I, not that I've seen yet, but I haven't seen the ninth and tenth degrees, so it might be hidden there. Oh, okay. I was just trying. <laughs> um, so anyway. I just wanted to uh, say thanks to everybody for listening. Make sure you guys do your hashtag Sparklight campaign because we are going to draw that next week. Um, we're really excited about uh, putting together something really cool for the uh, the winner. I know John's going to talk more about it. I just want to say uh, super enlightening to hear about the Swedish Rite. So much more than you would ever even hope to gather from you know checking out a Wikipedia article or whatever. Uh, so thanks so much, Christian, for coming on and, and giving us uh, some insight into this wonderful Rite. And also, if you like Masonic podcasts, check out Whence Came You. It comes out on the Sunday nights at 9.30. Thanks. And also, I don't know if you wanted to talk about your holiday gift-giving guide that you came out with. Oh, I did. Yeah, so I came out with a really neat <laughs> uh, a holiday gift-giving guide for Mason. In it, um, I, I don't have products to sell. So what you're going to get in that are actually neat Masonic gifts that are really neat. Uh, that I'm not getting you know anything out of, out of uh, advertising anything. This was something we put together, and uh, there were neat Masonic gifts or gifts for gentlemen uh, who are Masons also um, that would typically enjoy some really nice things. Uh, so check it out. It's a free PDF. You can get it off of wcypodcast.com. It's on Issue. It's on Magster. Um, check it out. Okay, and I can find that on wcypodcast.com. Yeah. Okay, excellent, thanks. Let's switch to Jason. All right, thanks, John. Um, really, really awesome episode. Christian, thank you so much for, for coming on and sharing your, your wealth of knowledge on, on a subject that I don't think many people in the U.S. have access to. So this is just really, really cool. Um, you know, for, forgot to... Uh, to mention a couple things, uh, a couple comments from Tommy uh, Dillon and, and Joseph Vanderstelt talking about you know the overt Christian nature of of the uh, of the Swedish right and you know whether or not that would that would really work for them or, or work you know in, in the American system, and I think you know you can you can kind of go either way. I mean, if if you happen to be a Christian who's really into your faith, like like I am, you know, Swedish right sounds like a, a really cool thing, just because it reinforces your worldview and your teachings. But there's also something to be said about the uh, about the acceptance and the tolerance of men of all faiths that's found in the uh, the American lodge system and and the English lodge system. Um, so it's again, you know, you can make masonry what you want it. And you just have to figure out your flavor and your brand. And so I, I think this is just a fantastic show. And I, and I think the Swedish right, you know, has some good things going on. I can see where it'd be a problem if, uh, if it were the only right practice. But I was really glad to hear that there are a couple English emulation lodges here and there for, for people who aren't interested in that brand of, of masonry. Uh, my name's Jason Richards, Junior Warden for Acacia Lodge Number 16 in Clifton, Virginia. I've got a blog, Two Foot Ruler, Masonry in Plain Language. Go check it out. 
thank you so much for the links, the likes, all of the comments. Um, I, I've mentioned social media is one of my favorite times in the show because I get to go and, and troll all the interaction, and then that just troll, 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 um, and that just really adds to uh, to the discussion and, and the show, and I think it's just fantastic. And we can't do that without you guys watching the show and being interested in what we're talking about. So please keep recommending topics to us. Um, there are a lot of things that, that we've thought of, and there are a lot of things that we haven't. So let us know what, uh, what you're interested in hearing, and uh, have a fantastic week. Next week, we will be drawing for the Sparklight campaign. Uh, you'll want to be there for that because it'll be awesome. And uh, whoever wins it is, uh, is going to get some good stuff. Alrighty. Let's switch to Nick. Hey, everybody. Okay, so this is what I'm going to say. Swords, flipping heraldry, uh, like knights, degrees, so the, the offices don't matter, no minutes, no nothing, just no youth education, groups. no youth... <laughs> that. <laughs> I, <love> that. <laughs> I mean, honestly, this is like the greatest thing I've ever heard in my entire life. I mean, this is like... This is like... A, a, okay, so it's like marriage, birth of my children, uh... The twins not well. They almost got to the World Series, and then this. <laughs> Honestly, this. This is so cool. I'm like so excited to go out there. One day I'm gonna join the Sons of Norway just to get the discount. See, I'm joining another thing. If you can hear that, <laughs> just so I can get the discounted tickets to the Nordic countries. Cha-ching. Just so I can, just so I can fly around. I'll tell, I'll tell my wife and family. Sorry guys, I gotta go three times a week because it's important. Have fun doing whatever you're doing. Because this is so cool. Uh, so thank you very much, Brother Christian. This was awesome. Uh, I have a blog, millennialformason.com. I just posted a... Uh, oh, what would you call it? Uh, something controversial on it a little bit. Uh, taking a certain managing editor to task for certain comments he made in his letter in a national publication... I'll leave it at that, but you know where to find it, millennialfreemason.com. Uh, I'm also on reddit.com. Uh, uh, Masonic Meme Monday was not as 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 good this week, but I did win it this year, So or this, this week, so let's see if I can get that <laughs> up, <laughs> because there you go. It's so there you Scottish go. right. If it's not Scottish right, it's crap. <laughs> so yeah, um, it was it was uh, th- that was about it. And so uh, thanks everybody, and uh, I I can't wait for next week with the uh, Sparklight campaign and everything else. So right. awesome. Uh, Reddit.com/r/freemason. Awesome. Thanks, Nick. Christian. I'll just say thank you very much for having me on, brethren. It's been an uh, absolute pleasure, and keep up the good work that you guys are doing. There's a lot of us that's enjoying uh, what you guys are doing, so keep it up. Awesome. I do appreciate thank it. Thank you. All right. Yeah, in closing, I think it was said best uh, sometime during the night tonight, which was Swedish Rite sounds like it takes the best of Freemasonry and gets rid of the worst of Freemasonry. And so with that, um, you know, we really can't. Yeah, that was Jason. Yeah, go ahead, Jason. Get credit for that one. Um, but in all seriousness, that that really does sound very appealing. And uh, you know, the with the combination of the the education and the esoterics and limiting the you know administrivia, it sounds like a beautiful right. And so uh, I encourage everyone who has the ability to go check out the Swedish right when they can. Um, with that, a quick reminder of the Sparklight campaign. We hope to see you um, post some pictures up this week, and we'll be drawing one lucky winner. So stay tuned for that. And with that, thanks for watching. Keep searching for more lights. Have a good night.